The most challenging aspect of object tracking is arguably that the associations between measurements and objects is unknown. But what about if we assume that the associations were given? How can we then perform the prediction and update steps? This is what we will describe in this video. You might think that this is a special case of little interest, since the associations are generally unknown. However, it turns out that virtually all multi-object tracking solutions, at least for point objects, make use of the type of solutions that we present here. And you'll see these equations repeated over and over again throughout this course. Let us make the simplifying assumption that the data associations are known. This implies that once we have observed the measurement matrix at time k, we know the object measurement matrix capital OK. Note that we are still considering single object tracking of point objects, which means that the matrix OK either contains zero or one measurement vector. Another way to think about this is that we are performing single object tracking without any clutter, but where the object may or may not be detected. The objective in this video is to show how we can recursively compute the posterior density under these assumptions. That is, to show how we can recursively compute the posterior density of xk given the object detections up until and including time k. As usual, we split these recursive computations in a prediction and an update step. Let us start with a prediction step, which I hope you will find quite simple. Given that we have a motion model, how can we then perform prediction? Well, as usual, we use the chapman kolmogorov equation, which means that we take the product of the posterior at time k-1 and the motion model, and we then integrate out the state at time k-1. Note that the motion model has not really changed compared to last week, and the prediction step is also performed in exactly the same way. For instance, if we have linear and Gaussian models, the prediction step would exactly follow the equations of a comma filter, such that we get the predicted mean by taking the posterior mean at time k-1 and multiply with the motion model matrix F, and we get the predicted covariance matrix by taking F, P, F transpose, plus the covariance of the motion noise, Q. The conclusion from this is that the prediction step is performed in a standard manner, but what about the update step? The question we'd like to answer is, given a measurement model of the following form, how can we then perform the update step? In principle, this is completely straightforward. You may recall that Bayes' rule tells us that the posterior is proportional to the prior times of likelihood. In this context, this means that the posterior at time k is the predicted density, p of xk, given the object detections up until time k-1, which is the prior in this context, times gk of capital OK given xk, which is the likelihood or the measurement model. If we plug in the expression for the measurement model, we get two possible expressions. A first possibility is that the matrix capital OK does not contain any measurements, which means that the object was not detected, and the posterior is then proportional to the predicted density times 1 minus pd of xk. A second possibility is that the matrix OK contains a measurement vector OK, which is then the object detection, and the posterior is then proportional to the predicted density times pd of xk times the measurement model for the vector OK. The fact that there are two possible cases may give this expression a complicated look, but note that we have assumed that the matrix OK is known, and then we always know which of the two expressions to use. I'd like to emphasize that this equation will appear many times in this course, and it is very useful if you can gain intuition for it already now. In fact, different versions of this equation are used in all algorithms that we will learn, at least during the first five weeks. Let us look at two examples to understand these equations in more detail. In many cases, pd of xk is assumed constant within the area of interest, and then we can remove it from these equations. However, I'd like to start with an example where we highlight why it cannot always be ignored. To understand why the factor pd of xk is included, let us consider an example specifically designed to illustrate that it can be informative. To get started, suppose the predicted density is Gaussian with zero mean and variance one. Let us also assume that the object detection ok is independent of the state xk and that it has some distribution p of ok regardless of the value of xk. This means that the vector OK does not actually carry any information about xk, which is arguably an unusual but possible case. 
To make the example even more interesting, let us assume that the probability of detection varies significantly in the area where we believe that the object is. Specifically, we'll assume that it is zero whenever xk is negative and one when xk is positive, such that it changes value from zero to one when xk is equal to zero, which happens to be the mean of our Gaussian prior. Note that this implies that if we observe a detection, then xk must be positive. And if we don't observe a detection, xk must be negative. Let us now look at the expression for the posterior and check if it makes sense. The general expression for the posterior that we saw on the previous slide is as follows. Before we discuss the details of this equation, I'd like to point out that the measurement likelihood for the vector OK does not depend on xk in this example, which means that this factor can be crossed out and removed. That is, under the assumption that the matrix OK contains a vector OK, the posterior is simply proportional to the predicted density times PD of xk. Let us now look at the equations in more detail and start with the assumption that the object is undetected. If the object is undetected, we know from this equation that xk must be negative. When the object is undetected, the matrix OK is empty and the posterior is proportional to the predicted density times 1 minus PD. As you can see, 1 minus PD is 0 whenever xk is positive and 1 whenever xk is negative. We are therefore multiplying the predicted density with 0 for all positive xk and 1 for all negative xk. Given that the predicted density is the Gaussian density illustrated using this blue curve, the posterior density must have the same shape as the blue curve for negative values of xk and take the value 0 for all positive values of xk. Since the posterior density must integrate to 1, it turns out that the posterior is the green dashed curve illustrated here, where we have multiplied the blue curve by 2 for negative values of xk and by 0 for all positive values of xk. Using similar arguments, we can consider the case when the object is detected and the matrix OK contains a measurement vector and conclude that the posterior density is this magenta colored curve, which is 0 when xk is negative and proportional to the prior for all positive values of xk. To conclude this example, I would like to point out two things. First of all, this example demonstrates that the probability of detection can be informative and that it cannot always be ignored. Second, it is important to note that this is a toy example specifically designed to illustrate that PD of xk may be important. And in most situations, the measurement vector OK is far more informative than the probability of detection. As a second example, Suppose the probability of detection is instead constant, which means that it does not convey any information about xk. The general expression for the posterior is as follows. Where we have a factor 1 minus pd of xk when the object is undetected, and a factor pd of xk when it is detected. Under the assumption that the probability of detection is a constant, both of these factors are constants that can be absorbed into the proportionality constant. We can therefore simplify the expression by removing the factors that contain PD of xk. As you can see, if the object is undetected, the posterior is identical to the prior. And this is probably what you would expect in situations where we fail to detect the object. Similarly, when the object is detected, we multiply the predicted density with a likelihood function of the object measurement. What you see here just looks like the standard equations for the posterior when we observe a measurement vector OK. One way to summarize this is that we perform a standard update using the vector OK, but only if the object is detected. To clarify even further what I meant with standard update on the previous slide, we can look at a linear and Gaussian example for which the update step is simple. Specifically, suppose the predicted density is a Gaussian density with mean x bar k given k minus 1 and a covariance p k given k minus 1 and a linear and Gaussian measurement model with matrix hk and covariance rk. In that case, the posterior density is also Gaussian. If the object is undetected, such that the matrix OK is empty, the posterior has the same mean and covariance as the predicted density. If the object is instead detected, the posterior density is proportional to a Gaussian prior times a linear and Gaussian measurement likelihood, which means that the posterior mean and covariance are given by a standard Kalman filter update. You can pause the video if you want to look at the Kalman filter equations. But the bottom line is that we perform a standard Kalman filter update if the object is detected, and we leave the predicted density as it is if the object is undetected.
Let us finish by visualizing what the prediction and update steps might look like in an even more specific example. Suppose we have a two-dimensional state vector representing position and velocity along a line, that we are using a constant velocity model and that the initial prior is Gaussian. As a measurement model, we assume that we have a probability of detection of 0.85, which also means that PD is constant. Finally, we assume that when the object is detected, we observe its position with some additive Gaussian noise. In this illustration, the green curve represents the prior at time 0, the blue curve the predicted density at time 1, the black line represents an observation of the position, and the magenta line represents the posterior at time 1. This is the relation that we generally expect to see, where the prediction shifts the PDF and increases the uncertainties, whereas the update step decreases the uncertainties and shifts the density towards the regions that match the measurement better. At later times, the green curve instead represents the posterior at time k-1. But the relation between the different densities is similar. At time k equals 3, the relations are instead different since the object happens to be undetected. In this case, the predicted density is not actually visible since it is identical to the posterior density. As you can see, the posterior uncertainties at time k equals 3 are larger than at time k equals 2 and they would continue to increase over time if the object remains undetected. However, at time k equal 4, the object is again detected, and the posterior uncertainties therefore decrease again. To summarize, in this video we have studied the prediction and update steps under the assumption that the data associations are known. These equations are used extensively in the rest of this course, so please try to make sure that you understand them properly. The prediction step is actually identical to last week whereas the update equation takes different forms depending on if the object is detected or undetected.